Well, welcome to another study in the book of Colossians. I am so excited to get into this passage with you. Uh, this is really the heart of the entire book of Colossians, uh, is in Colossians 1, 15, down to verse 20. And uh, I've, been, I've been anxious, uh, not in a, in a bad way, but I've been so excited, zealous, passionate about getting into this passage. And we're actually going to split this into two sections, and I, I want us to just spend time delighting and just focusing on the reality of Jesus Christ. Now, I know what some of you are probably thinking. Uh, you're thinking, wow, we have spent a lot of time in chapter 1. And I would say, you're correct. <laughs> in fact, we have a couple more studies in chapter 1. But it's very purposeful. Uh, Paul is doing the very, very same thing, if, if I can maybe give that as a picture. Chapter 2 is all focused on the false teaching. Chapter 3 and 4 is on the practicals. But all of that is built upon the foundation of chapter 1. And if you really miss the heart of chapter 1, you're going to miss what, what Paul is doing and why he keeps appealing back to this idea in chapters 2, 3, and 4. And so I really want to spend just a lot of time in chapter 1 to build that foundation so that as we get into the other sections, we can go through those quicker because we understand what Paul is doing here in chapter 1. And so I've taken verses 15 down to verse 20, and we're going to split it into two sessions, this one and the next one. And I'm so excited to look at the reality of Jesus with you. But just to get started, I want to read this passage. And again, I just want to set it before us and just have it in our mind. So this is Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15. This is what Paul says. Speaking about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. There are a few passages in Scripture that I think are absolutely phenomenal in talking about the reality and the triumph of Christ Jesus, this being one of those. Uh, the other one would be like in Philippians chapter 2, uh, verse 5 through 11, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. There are some great kind of these summary statements of just the kingly authority and person and majesty of Jesus Christ. And as we come to the passage, uh, I just wanted to mention this probably more so for all the nerds <laughs> who are watching, uh, but there's an interesting chiastic structure uh, in the passage. Now, uh, don't let that term dissuade you or uh, even distract you. Uh, a chiastic structure is where you have this kind of a, a structure in the passage itself that's either a parallel or it kind of all moves to a single point. And I, I mention this because there's something beautiful happening in Colossians. And again, if you want to study this out, you're more than welcome to. It's also in the, in the notes if you want to download the, the notes for this particular session. But what you see <clears throat> on the screen is there's these two big sections and you have these parallel statements that run through both of them. Uh, for example, in verse 15, you have, who is the image of the invisible God? And then down in verse, I think it's 19, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead? So you have these parallel statements, and I put them in color so you can kind of see uh, how, how they're parallel. But you have this, who is, and then you have the firstborn, for in him, all things, and through him. And you see that in both the first few verses and then the, the last few verses. And kind of squished right between all of that is this phenomenal central focus of who Jesus is. And let me just read this. The central focus of this section is, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. Regardless of whether that even makes sense to you, <laughs> that doesn't even matter. The whole point is, the whole passage is focused on the majesty and the glory of Jesus Christ. And the real emphasis of the passage, which we're going to get into, is looking at this idea that he is to be preeminent, that he is have to have first place in all things. So let's dive into this. Uh, in verse 15, Paul says this, 
Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, it's interesting as we get into this passage, there is what we could call the mystery of godliness. Uh, Paul uses this term in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And l- look at what Paul says to Timothy. He says, great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Jesus was manifested in the flesh. Uh, here is this great mystery of godliness, Paul says. God, the creator of the universe, has been manifested in human form. And he says, without controversy, <laughs> this is a great mystery. And the reason it's a great mystery is because you, you have this rather seemingly, well, this tension going on in the passage. See, we are told that God is invisible, that nobody can see God, and he has never been seen, nor can be seen. And those are some great passages in Scripture. And then yet we're told, well, God can be seen, he is seen, he's been made manifest. Well, how is that possible? How can you have an invisible God that you can never see, and yet you have a God who you can see? Paul says that is the great mystery of godliness. And he's dealing with that here, even in our passage. And he says, look, here is Jesus who has been manifested in the flesh. Here here is Jesus in the flesh, and he is the declaration, the manifestation. He is the reality, the image of God himself. This is such an exciting idea to me that runs all through Scripture. We know that that we can't see God. Hey, we get it. He's invisible. He's a spirit. Woo, that's awesome. And yet there's all these scenes in the Old Testament where God shows up where it's like he's seen, he's tangible, he can be felt. Uh, For example, in the garden scene, there's this indication that God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day within the garden. That it wasn't just this mystical spirit thing, that God was really walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. What? (laughs) Uh, Maybe one of the clearest illustrations is that whole fiery furnace scene with Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar takes Daniel's friends, you know, Rack, Shack, and Binny, if you saw that version, and he throws them in the fiery fur- furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar looks inside the furnace and goes, hold on, hold on, hold on. How many guys did we throw into the furnace? And they say, three guys. And Nebuchadnezzar says, well, why do I see four? And one of them looks like the Son of God. Here's my question for you. Who do you think he saw? Now, a lot of people say, well, he saw an angel. Man, yeah, maybe. But actually, I I think you're missing the whole point of the Old Testament. Uh, There's this idea of the mystery that Paul talks about in a lot of his writings. And it's the fact that God has, has always been there and he's revealed himself in Jesus. Jesus is the grand mystery of Scripture. And what you see is that even though God is invisible and you cannot see him, we can yet see him in Jesus. Now, Jesus, hey, I understand, Jesus was born 2,000 years ago. The God of the universe became incarnate 2,000 years ago and was birthed in a little babe by Mary. And yet, do you realize that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last? He's always been, and he always will be. In fact, we hear that even in our passage, that he's the creator of all things. So Paul says that when, when God spoke creation into existence, and he said, let there be light, Paul says, do you, know, do you know whose lips it came off of? Jesus, because he is the creator of all things. John in John 1 says that he's the word, and the word has been before all things, and he is God himself. So here's the emphasis. When you come into the Old Testament, and you hear the word God, Yahweh, Jehovah, you, you, most of us think Father, but that's actually a bad preconception. Yeah, the Father's there, but again, we're talking about the triune God. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, who is, it's one God in three persons. And that is, the whole idea of the Trinity is so mind-boggling, and we'll never be able to wrap our mind around it. I get that. But you realize that in the Old Testament, when we're talking about God, we're talking not of the, just merely the Father, we're talking of the triune God himself, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all operating, all working, all moving, all talking, all doing as one. So when you come to the Old Testament, Jesus is all over the place. Why? Because he's there. He's God. And it seems like, if if I can make a a concept, uh, maybe 
illuminate a concept for you. The New Testament says that, that Jesus is the physical representation of the invisible. That, that when you look at Jesus, you see God himself. And it seems to indicate that the only person of the Trinity that you will ever see is Jesus. Because the Father and the Spirit <clears throat> are spirit, and we, we can't see them. They're invisible. And there's passages in Scripture that indicate that. And yet, Jesus is the visible representation of the invisible. So in the Old Testament then, when someone encounters God in the flesh, I would like to propose to you that they probably ex saw and experienced Jesus. Now again, he was incarnate 2,000 years ago. He was born 2,000 years ago. He took on flesh 2,000 years ago. I get that. I'm, hey, I'm, I, hey, I'll fight on that one. <laughs> However, <clears throat> Jesus has always been. And if he's the physical representation of the invisible, it seems like he's the only part of the triune God that we can ever see. So there's these scenes, for example, Abraham has these three, what we presume are angels, who come for dinner. And two of them eventually after dinner go to Sodom and Gomorrah to deal with that whole thing. And one of them sticks with Abraham and is talking to Abraham. And in the middle of the conversation, you realize that's not an angel. Abraham is talking to God himself. Now, scholars call that the Christophonic angel, meaning, well, is it an angel? I don't know. Is it God? I don't know. Could I just propose to you? Maybe it was Jesus. It seems like if God is actually in the flesh talking to Abraham, that would be Jesus. Jacob uh, is running from Esau, and uh, he's wrestling he, on one night. He wrestles with this, what we presume is an angel. But by the, by the dawn of the morning, we realize that was not an angel. It was God himself that Jacob was wrestling with. Who do you think he wrestled with? Uh, this man comes before Joshua as, as they're about to enter into the promised land. And Joshua says, who are you? And the man says, hey, I am the commander of the Lord's army. And that person de demands worship from Joshua. Because he, he, asks, he tells Joshua to remove his sandals, which is a sign of worship in that culture. Now, no angel ever allows a human to worship them. An angel shows up, someone falls face down, and the angel always says, no, 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 get up, get up, get up, get up. You do not worship me, you worship God alone. And yet here is a quote-unquote angel demanding worship, and he says, hey, I'm the commander of the Lord's army. Who is the commander of the Lord's army? Isn't it Jesus? And so you see this all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, Moses uh, it sees the back of God. Uh, you have this idea that uh, in Isaiah 6, Isaiah is in the temple. He sees this incredible vision. And John, in John chapter 12, says, Do you know who Isaiah saw? He saw Jesus. So you get this idea all throughout the Old Testament. And again, if we had time, I'd love to just open that up. And it is, it is one of the most beautiful concepts to me uh, in all of Scripture is just seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. It is so phenomenal. But Paul would say that's the mystery of godliness. That, that here is this invisible God that we cannot see, and yet here is a visible God that we can see. Well, how does that make sense? He says, without controversy, great is that mystery of godliness. That Jesus was manifested. That God was manifested in the flesh. Jesus. Well, with that idea, I, I want you to see this passage because Paul is making this a phenomenal declaration of who Jesus is. And he's leaving no wiggle room for the reality that Jesus is God himself. And so what I'd like to do in this passage is I want to give you a few characteristics or attributes or declarations that Paul makes of Jesus, of who Jesus is. So number one is this idea that Jesus is God himself. And it comes from this idea of the image in verse 15. Uh, when you look at that word image, uh, again, the passage is, who is the image of the invisible God? Uh, the word image, the word means an exact representation and revelation. So this isn't a foggy perspective. This isn't a, well, maybe, maybe not. This is a clear, exact representation and revelation. And the idea is that Jesus is the full revelation or manifestation of, of the triune God. Here's what one scholar said about this particular word, uh, uh, I, I, icon. He says, icon, sometimes in its diminutive form, 
and that's another word. But that Greek word was used for a portrait. There is a papyrus letter from a young soldier called Apion to his father, Epimachus. Near the end, he writes, I send you a little portrait, and he uses this word, of myself painted by his friend. It is the nearest, this word, is the nearest equivalent in ancient Greek to our word photograph. But this word still had another use. When a legal document was drawn up, such as a receipt or an IOU, it always included a description of the chief characteristics and distinguishing marks of the contracting parties so that there could be no mistake. The Greek word for such a description is icon. The icon, therefore, was a kind of brief summary of the personal characteristics and distinguishing marks of the contracting parties. So Paul is saying, you know how, if you enter into a legal agreement, there is included an, an, an icon, icon, a description by which you may be recognized. Jesus is the portrait of God. In him, you see the personal characteristics and the distinguishing marks of God. If you want to see what God is like, look at Jesus. Isn't that a great statement? And so here's the idea. In a passage, Paul, without reservation, is saying Jesus himself is God himself. That there is no wiggle room in this. Jesus is God. That he is in the image of God. Meaning not like he's a painting yeah, the word has an indication, but more so that there is an exact imprint in Jesus. That when you look at Jesus, woo, you see God himself. You want to know what God looks like? You look at Jesus. How does God think? You look at Jesus. What, what is God, how does God talk like? Oh, you listen to Jesus. Hey, how, what's God's attitude and behavior? Oh, you look at Jesus. Which gives us an incredible insight into the Old Testament. That when we come into the Old Testament, and we say, okay, how do I interpret certain passages? How do I see, why is God doing that? Oh, you've got to see that in light of Jesus. Because God does not change. He does not alter. He does not shift. He cannot change who he is in nature. So there's this phenomenal idea that who he was, he is, and forever will be. As Hebrews 13 says. That, that God doesn't change. So the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament, which is the God of that you'll see forever and ever and ever. Amen. See, God was not a mean, nasty God in the Old Testament, a loving Jesus in the New Testament, but he's coming back as a wrathful judge. See, you, can't, you cannot come to that conclusion in the Scriptures. God does not change. He does not alter. He does not shift. Well, then how am I going to have to interpret the Old Testament? I have to see the Old Testament in light of Jesus. Well, how, how do I see the coming judgment? I've got to see that in light of Jesus because he does not shift or change. And again, there's these passages all through Scripture. So get this idea. To see what God is like, we must look at Jesus. He is the photograph, the image, the revelation, the manifestation of God to humanity in a way that they can know and understand. So how on earth are we going to comprehend who God is? Jesus. And, and you see this again in a bunch of passages. Let me read this quote from a scholar first. Uh, one scholar said it this way, if Paul meant that Jesus was merely similar to the Father, he would have used another Greek word, which speaks merely of similar appearance. This stronger word here proves that God, or sorry, the stronger word here proves that Paul knew that Jesus is God just as God the Father is God. It means that Jesus is the very stamp of God the Father. So look at these passages, John 1.14. John writes, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.18 says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. That word explain means like to demonstrate, to articulate, to reveal him. John 14.9 Jesus says, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not, sorry, let me start, start that over again. John 14, 9, Jesus said, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Jesus says, hey, when you look at me, you see the Father. There's no difference. Hebrews 1, 3, so let me, let me phrase that. There is a difference between the Father and the Son. 
However, if you want to look at, know what the Father's like, you look at Jesus. It's probably a better way of saying it. Uh, Hebrews 1.3. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. And when he had made purifications of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Colossians 2.9. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So grab a hold of that idea. Paul is saying that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That here is the overwhelming invisible God that we cannot see, but the mystery of godliness, he has made himself visible. How has he made himself visible? In Jesus. And there's the fullness of Jesus. The life of God himself is in Jesus. And when you look at Jesus, whoa, you see the totality of the triune God. That is such a crazy concept to me. But that is beautiful. And so Paul starts and says, Jesus is God alone. That, that Jesus himself is God himself. That there is no difference. That God is Jesus. Here's the second idea that is in the passage. And it's the fact that Jesus is the priority, or you could say Jesus is the focus. And it comes from that word firstborn. Uh, it's interesting that the word firstborn doesn't mean firstborn in terms of uh, origin. In other words, like, I am the firstborn son of my parents. That, and that's true. Hey, I'm the firstborn. But that's not this idea. Uh, this idea it's, means the priority of position, not origin. And the idea really is that of an heir or it's the preeminent one, not necessarily the one born first. Uh, and there's a bunch of examples in Scripture. For example, uh, Esau was born first, yet Jacob was actually considered the firstborn. Uh, he's the one who got the inheritance. He's the one that got the birthright. In fact, uh, I think it's in Exodus. It says that Jacob was the firstborn. And of course, you look at it and say, well, I thought Esau was born first. Yeah, he biologically came out first, but he gave up the rights of being the firstborn, and Jacob was the firstborn. Uh, you have that idea with Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, Ishmael was the firstborn of Abraham, and yet he was not the firstborn. He, Isaac was the firstborn. And we're talking about priority in terms of the heir, in terms of the inheritance, and in terms of the uh, preeminence, in terms of being the, the, the focal point. Isaac was the focus. The, he was the firstborn. Uh, you had uh, the Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh was first, but Ephraim got the blessing. Uh, you have this idea that Solomon, King Solomon, he was not the firstborn of David. In fact, David had a lot of kids before Solomon. And yet, Solomon became the firstborn, as it says in Psalm 89, that he had the privileges, that he had the, he had the blessing, he had the kingship of David. So again, this idea runs all through Scripture. So look at this idea. Paul says that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. And that doesn't mean he, you know, he was literally born first because, well, we understand he was, he was incarnate 2,000 years ago. So there's a lot of people that came before Jesus. But we're not talking about biological, or, you know, the, the, the orient, uh, of, or uh, like coming into being biologically. We're talking about priority and focus and preeminence. It's interesting, I was, came across this scholar who, who said it this way, uh, and a lot of this came out of Lightfoot's uh, commentary stuff, but uh, th this particular scholar was quoting Lightfoot, and he said this, he said, in no way does the title firstborn indicate that Jesus is less than God. In fact, the ancient rabbis called Yahweh himself, quote, the firstborn of the world. And ancient rabbis used firstborn as a messianic title. And they used to quote, quote it saying, God said, as I made Jacob a firstborn, so also will I make King Messiah a firstborn. So again, I find that really intriguing. That, again, we're not talking about the sense of, well, yeah, in terms of, yeah, I'm the firstborn son. Yeah, it's not that. And we understand that he's the only begotten of the Father. Hey, hey that makes sense. But the emphasis of what Paul is saying is not in the sense of biology. He's talking about in the sense of importance and in terms of focus and in terms of priority. <coughs> Excuse me. So Paul is saying here that here is Jesus and he is the image of the invisible God. He is God himself. But not only that, 
but that he is the one that has all the priority. He's the one with all the focus. Hey, he is, he is the big deal, the preeminent one of all creation. And when you look at all of creation, what is the big focal point of creation? Paul says it is Jesus. Which gets us into our third thing, which number three is this idea of Jesus is the creator, which comes in verse 16. So verse 16 says this, For in him, Jesus, all things were created, both in heaven, in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. I love what Paul is saying here. He says, hey, whether you see it or whether you don't see it, Jesus is king over all because he's the creator of all. And again, we'll look at more of this when we get into chapter 2. But, but Paul here is setting the stage for what he's going to talk about in terms of dealing with some of the Gnosticism that was creeping into the Coloss- Colossians church. And at that time, uh, a lot of the Jews and a lot of the Gnostics had this hierarchy when it comes to the spiritual realm. And so they had, you know, had the dominions and principalities and powers and mights and all those kind of things. And those were hierarchies of the angelic realm. And so the Jews put a lot of importance on the angelic. Uh, the Gnostics, you know, had this, imp- had this list. And Jesus was on the list, but he was kind of uh, down toward the bottom, underneath all this angelic uh, realm and messengers and all that kind of stuff. Paul blows that idea out of the water because he's saying he's not on the list because he's the creator of that list. So whether you look around and you see plants and animals and and humans, or whether you look in the spiritual realm and you see the angelic, you know, the cherubim, the seraphim, and the angels, regardless, all of that was created by Jesus. And he is the creator of all. Therefore, he is over all. And so I love this emphasis of what Paul is making. Again, when God was speaking creation into existence in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, Jesus, hey, the words in themselves were coming off the lips of Jesus, says Paul. That he was intimately involved in the creation of all things. And so when you look around and we go, wow, look at that sunrise. Whoa, look at that sunset. Whoa, look at that apple tree. Whoa, whatever you want to whoa on. You realize that that is to cause a a praise, a declaration of worship unto Jesus because he is the creator of it all. So again, Paul is emphasizing the fact that Jesus is the creator. Uh, It's interesting that in Greek philosophy, which had really influenced the the Roman days in which Paul is is speaking, uh, the Greek philosophy argued that uh, everything needed three main things. Uh, It needed a primary cause or a plan. It needed an instrumental cause, the power, and there was something to bring that plan about. And then it needed a final cause, which was the whole purpose of the thing. I love this. Paul is even using that Greek philosophy that that everything needed a plan, power, and purpose, or this primary instrumental and uh, final uh, cause, and says, do you realize that Jesus is all three? That he is the plan, he is the power, and he's the purpose. And he says that here in verse 16. And he says, do you realize that everything that you look at All of creation, Jesus is the plan, the power, and the purpose behind that. That is a phenomenal thought. That is just just mind-boggling to me. So again, as we come to the passage, Paul in verse 15 is emphasizing the fact that Jesus is God. He also emphasizes the fact that he is firstborn, that he is the priority, he is the focus, that he is the preeminence of this whole thing. Third, in verse 16, he is the creator And then number four, in verse 17, he talks about the fact that Jesus is the sustainer. So in verse 17, it says this, And Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That he is the sustainer of this whole thing. Uh, That word before uh, means before, above, in front of, earlier, than. And it's interesting that it can be used for both time and position. So that happened before. I ate breakfast before lunch. Meaning what? The time in which breakfast happened is in the time before lunch. So it can be used in that sense. Uh, It can also be used in the sense of position. 
uh, and authority uh, in, in the sense of uh, he is before all things, is how Paul uses it. That he is the, uh, he's the head, that he is the creator, that he is the leader, that he is the orientation of the whole thing, that he is that, woo! That's the, and I think both of them are being used here. Because he is the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, that he is the first and the last, the beginning and the ending. That he is before all things. That even before anything was ever created, he was there before. And yet he's also before it in the sense that he is the head of it. That he's the creator of it. That, that he is the sustainer of it. That he is the, that idea. Which I think is really neat. Uh, then he says, and in him all things hold together. And that word hold together, some translations say all things consist. It means to be, get this, compacted together, united to, co- to cohere, to be held together, to be or to become composed of many parts in a cohesive and enduring whole. In other words, the emphasis of the passage is, here is Jesus who is the creator of all things. And he's before it, not only in time, but also in position. But he also holds all of creation together. That he is the glue which holds creation. He is the sustainer of it. Everything consists in him. Which is very similar to what Paul says in Ephesians uh, chapter 1, verse 9 through 10. Paul said this, uh, speaking about Jesus. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him, in Jesus, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of times. Get this. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. So here are the ideas. It's like this big funnel, and all things go in this funnel at the top, and it's all coming down to one point. What is the whole point? What is the whole plan? What is, the whole, what is everything funneling down to? Well, the summation, the focal point of all things is to be Jesus. Why? He's preeminent. He, he, this is all about him. Isn't that a phenomenal? Oh, it's, oh, it's so good. That, that my whole life is to be summarized by Jesus. My work is to be summarized by Jesus. Creation is to be all focused and s- summarized in Jesus. That everything in history is coming down to a focal point, which is Jesus. That's amazing. Uh, Listen to what one scholar said about this whole idea. I love this. It says the Son is not only the agent of creation, in other words, it was through him that creation was made, but he is also the goal of creation. That is to say, creation was created to be his. So, and here's kind of the summary statement, the Son is the beginning of creation and the end of creation and the power who holds all creation together. He's the creator, the sustainer, and the final goal of creation the world. Isn't that a great thought? So as we come to our passage, here is Jesus again giving these four phenomenal ideas. He's saying that he is God. Woo! He is God himself. That he is the image. He's saying that he is the firstborn. He is the priority. That he is the focus. He's saying that he is the creator of all things and that he is the sustainer. He's the glue that holds this whole thing together. All things is being summarized and funneled down to a focal point, which is Jesus. Now, if I can make one other statement, uh, as you kind of step back from this passage, there's this neat idea that even though Paul is talking about the grandness of Jesus and the, the, the largeness and the majesty and the glory of Jesus, he's still emphasizing the undercurrent of the passage is that our God is knowable. That he's not just estranged himself from us, that, that, that God has really made himself knowable to us. That he's not some God out there who's, who we have no relationship with. God has made himself known and is inviting us into this relationship and intimacy. I, I read this passage last time, but John 17, 3, Jesus, in, in talking about the incredible reality of what eternal life is, says this is eternal life, that they might know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He says, you want to know what eternal life is? It's embracing God himself. It's getting wrapped up in intimacy and relationship. It's not just knowing about God. It's actually having a relationship with God. And isn't it amazing as Paul is outlining who Jesus is in our passage, that he's not just some unrelatable God out there looking down 
at us from a distance, but that he has come and indwell our lives through his very spirit, and now you and I can have relationship with him. So again, as, as we look at our passage, I find it phenomenal. Jesus is God. Jesus is firstborn. Jesus is the creator, and he is the sustainer. And I really just want to pause there. And the reason being is there's so much in this passage, I want us to actually spend time dwelling on Jesus. And so in our next study together, I want to look at the rest of this passage. So I would highly encourage you to go back and read verses 15 through 20. If you have time, I would encourage you actually to dig into the passage. And if you want some help, I've created a study guide to help you do that. You can find the link below this video or in the show notes of the, of the audio. But I, I want you to wrestle and I want you to ponder and I want you to, to delight in the reality of who Jesus is. Not just what he has done, but who he is and what that means for our life. And really all of this is coming to a head because verse 18 is kind of the capstone of this entire passage. In fact, I would argue it is the summary statement of the entire book of Colossians. So I'm really excited, really excited to be diving into that with you in the next study. Would you embrace Jesus afresh? Would you let him be God of your life? Would you see him as the firstborn, the one that has all the priority and the focus? Hey, would you, would you wrap around, grab a hold of this idea that he is the creator of all things, and as such, he's also sustainer, he's the glue that holds it all together? What would that mean practically for your life if you lived in light of the fact of who Jesus actually is? I want to know Jesus in totality, not in bits and pieces that I, oh, I like that, I, I don't know about that one. I want to embrace Jesus as he is revealed in the scriptures. And I want that for you as well. Uh, pray with me. Uh, Lord, you are so, so majestic and glorious. Uh, Lord, I'm just dumbfounded by Paul's declaration of just who you are. Lord, somehow could you make this practical in our lives? Lord, I, I don't want this just to be an information, uh, just an exhortation uh, a head knowledge thing of who you are. Lord, somehow we need to experience you as the God of this universe, that you are the image of the invisible God. Lord, we need, we need to see you truly as the firstborn of all creation. Lord, that you are the priority and you are the focus. Lord, we need to experience you as creator. We need to see you as the sustainer. Lord, I pray that somehow you would take this abstract concept of knowing about you, and would you press that so deep into our lives where it radically changes who we are, and we cannot remain the same because we have somehow experienced the very nature of Jesus. Oh Lord, thank you that we get to serve the creator and sustainer of the whole world. Thank you that your spirit lives inside of us through your spirit, through your indwelling spirit, Thank you that you are the strength and the power of our lives and that you have made yourself known. Oh, that we might know you more. Lord, we just give you all the praise and the glory and adoration that you rightly deserve. We love you. In your precious name we pray. Amen.